Hello and welcome back to Politics and Polls. I'm Julian Zelizer, a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University, and this is my co-host and colleague, Sam. Sam Wong here, a proprietor of the Princeton Election Consortium and professor of neuroscience and molecular biology at Princeton University. So this week, Sam and I are delighted to have really one of the brightest and most insightful historians in the country, Rick Perlstein who's a New York Times bestselling author, uh, to talk a little bit about conservatism and what's going on in the election. Rick has really done a marvelous job uh, chronicling the history of conservatism between the ni- during the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, he has three books which have captured a lot of public attention before the storm which is about uh, Barry Goldwater and the 1964 election, particularly the people uh, who got him uh, to the top of that party and to get the nomination. Nixon Land, which is a really riveting account of Richard Nixon's comeback in the 1966 midterms and his rise to power and the various people and groups that surrounded him. And, And finally, and most recently, The Invisible Bridge, which is also a wonderful book about Ronald Reagan and the challenge to President Gerald Ford in the primaries and the significance of that challenge to American conservatism and American politics. And he's now working on another book that moves us forward to 1980. He's also a prolific journalist who has been producing a number of articles in many publications, including the Washington Spectator. So, uh, Rick, it's great to have you with us. Julian, great to be here. Great to meet Sam. So, uh, we have a lot of questions uh, for you, uh, but the one I was just curious to hear what you think of uh, based on all your work and all your writing, what do you think of this whole term alt-right, mm. uh, which has really come about, it's being used all the time. What, what, how does that strike you? Well, it wasn't one I was familiar with when we got into this campaign. My interest in Trump was sparked. Uh, Trump really, as it pertains to what is happening in conservatism and American politics that wasn't happening before, when I was reading an article uh, by Evan Osnos of The New Yorker last summer, he had happened to be doing reporting among white supremacists, you know, old-fashioned white, what, you know, what they call white nationalists now, when Trump announced his candidacy and watched in real time as they embraced him as one of their own, as an ally, which wasn't that gang's usual modus operandi. They, they generally see both parties as part of the you know, Zionist op, uh, occupation government. And so something was up. And... Uh, when he didn't uh, disdain those groups' endorsements necessarily. That was, of course, extraordinary too. And I realized that stuff that we traditionally consigned to the margins in our writing of the history of conservatism had possibly become the main event. And we had to revisit and think about that history in a new way. The alt-right, as I've come to understand it, is kind of a uh, younger hipper, more online-oriented, snarky. I mean, it's really, it defines an attitude of, um, well, it involves trolling. It involves involves, Pepe the Frog. Yeah, Pepe the Frog, uh, inside jokes. It's, you know, similar but different to the old uh, white nationalist right. And, of course, it's insinuated itself into uh, the culture, the political culture, the popular culture, much much greater than, you know, someone like uh, the author of the Turner Diaries ever did. It became something of a household phrase, of course, once Hillary Clinton used it. And uh, I don't know if you guys want to talk about that, but I found it a very curious speech uh, when she kind of singled out the outright as, you know, the problem. I saw it as her kind of opportunistically seeing a way to do something her campaign has been trying to do probably since the spring, which was find an efficient and clever way to separate the Donald Trump wing from the Republican Party to what she literally called the normal wing, you know, the, the, the Paul Ryan wing. And in that speech, she rehabilitated Ryan. She called him a social justice, social justice Catholic. She uh, did something that other forces in the Democratic Party in the, in the Democratic National Committee have already expressed their consternation at, which was a say, 
to Republicans. But isn't this uh, sort of a different facet of what we saw at the, at the Democratic Party's national convention back in July, where where the message, uh, at least from President Obama, and that evening was that one side is a side of, I don't know, patriotism, normal Americans, people who love their nation, and uh, and that's a large part of who we are, and everyone is welcome to be underneath that big umbrella, that big tent. And so it, it feels like a differently expressed version of that, where the other yeah, side Yeah, I think that there's, a, there's a certain, within, within the kind of that up particular upper rank of the Democratic Party, there's almost an instinct to try and, you know, fold as many people into, you know, your vision of the American community as possible. It's, it's a very high-minded sort of thing that, uh, you know, first found its expression in Barack Obama's famous injunction that there is no red America, there is no blue America. You know, unfortunately uh, for Hillary Clinton, these, you know, normal conservatives, you know, are the people who, you know, kept on holding hearings in Congress, you know, uh, basically holding her personally responsible for the death of an ambassador, that the same people who, you know, said that she's probably responsible for the death of uh, Vince Foster, they're not normal. But at the same time, they bear a complicated and certainly not parallel relationship to this group called the alt-right, which probably doesn't have a, too many uh, passions about lowering the top marginal tax rates, <laughs> uh, you know, repealing the Jones Act, you know, which was, you know, like an obsession of Newt Gingrich and, and, and um, Ed, Edwin Meese, you know, um, probably doesn't think too much about uh, policy at all. It's, uh, it's about attitude. It's about tribal identification. So, yeah, if you broaden it out to the question of what Trumpism uh, is and how it differs from conservatism pa uh, past, then you have a very rich seam of inquiry, which I'm actually more comfortable with because uh, I don't really feel like I have a, a grasp of the alt right yet. What its genealogy is, you know, I mean, it, it bears a very one of its leaders I do know something about who I find a really fascinating figure is this guy. Uh, Milo goes by Milo Y. He's Greek. Uh, Milo, uh, can you, any of you guys pronounce his last name? Yiannopoulos. Yiannopoulos, yeah. Um, I read an absolutely riveting and very satisfying analysis about what he's about by the British journalist Laurie Penny, in which he pointed out that here's this guy who comes from this uh, kind of Oxbridge uh, kind of performative debating culture in which it's very uh, suave and sophisticated to be able to debate both sides of any question with equal passion, in which uh, everyone kind of does it with a wink and a nod, uh, that it's all about sort of showing how clever you are. And he's imported this culture, uh, along with a kind of uh, megalomania and narcissism and will to power, to a place America, where these political debates go on with much greater sincerity and much greater passion, and has built this uh, following of people, and I saw it in the flesh, who see him is as a kind of uh, incarnation of the political godhead. And that sort of cynicism is, uh, you know, it's always had a place in politics, but it's reached kind of a stratospheric level with some of these alt-right leaders who just see it as kind of a way to kind of play some fun and games, a political sphere. And uh, it's totally. there, you know. But totally. it's, fi it's funny, when, when, I, when Donald Trump, emerged and when a lot of these groups started to come to the forefront of uh you know public debate or they were circling his campaign i actually thought of all your books and you know i always read them as arguing uh, against this normal vision of conservatism that people right. like to talk about that a lot of this i saw in your books on nixon land and goldwater these groups were always there uh, conservatism was not quite as you know pristine or refined as some people like to yeah, remember. Yeah, it's, it's it's not people sitting around reading Hayek and 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 uh, you know and study carols, <laughs> but you know, figuring out you know like uh, how to how to, how to fight the imminentizing of the eschaton. Yeah, but are there similarities? I mean, in yeah. The Nixon, well, you know what? Let me give you, let me yeah. give an example. At this is this parallel is something that was going on in the early '60s in which uh, rather than, you know, the sort of the Democrats kind of defining who was and wasn't normal, it was going on, you know, within the conservative tent itself. And the figure of William F. Buckley was very active in policing the boundaries of proper conservatism. And in the early 60s, there was a very strong sense within the conservative movement that there were two strains 
In fact, even the Kennedy administration, which did some investigating of conservatisms for IRS purposes, there's something called the Ruther Memo, and they draw the same distinction. On the one hand, there was the people around uh, Buckley who kind of saw liberalism as the problem, saw communism as, you know, they were extremely concerned about it. They were extremely concerned about even uh, the infiltration of communists within the government. But they basically saw communism as a foreign thing, as a geostrategic problem. And on the other side were the people around the John Birch Society and uh, Robert Welch, who basically saw every strain of liberalism as the product of uh, communist infiltration. They were profoundly conspiratorial. You know, Robert Welch had the principle of reversal, where like everything a communist said, which meant everything a liberal said, was the, act the opposite of what they actually meant. You know, he you know would rate countries on how far they were gone to communism and, you know, a country like, you know, France was 80% communist, you know. So it was, it was that was basically, and, and William F. Buckley basically kicked them out of National Review and kicked them out of the National Conservative Movement. So they, after that point, they were kind of seen as irrelevant. But I find that my, my own sense of what was going on in my books has kind of been complicated uh, by what's happened first. You know, let me give, give you a couple examples. I wrote about the people around, you know, William F. Buckley, the National Review people, the, the Young Americans for Freedom, basically based on interviews with this guy, these guys, uh, taking over a meeting of something called the National Student Association, which was kind of a national umbrella group for politically active students, which ironically was started by the CIA. That's a different <laughs> complicated story. But uh, they took it over, you know, using uh, kind of Roger Stone methods. They created a phony middle of the road caucus in order to kind of get their supposedly anodyne platform planks that were actually were intended to be kind of Trojan horse conservatism. They wore, they wore sort of secret outfits to identify each other. This kind of, this kind of subterfuge and kind of Nixonian tactics. And I saw it the way kind of they saw it as kind of hijinks and fun and games. But when I look back at it, I'm like, wow, this was the kind of stuff that uh, led to Watergate. And that even this sort of normal conservative, kind of national view of conservatism, had this sort of very dark kind of anti-democratic strain in it. You know, the other example is you had something in the early 60s, uh, not only the, the, you know, John Birch Society stuff, which was basically print, reported uh, in the media as outside everything that was normal and decent about American politics. It was treated with a condescension that Trump's folks are never treated with now because the Trump the, the media doesn't have that sort of moral certitude that it once did. But, you know, it also included uh, a militia faction. You know, you had uh, the Minutemen that was stockpiling massive amounts of weapons. The U.S. attorney in New York uh, raided a farm that was getting ready to, you know, and found like, you know, thousands of rounds of ammunition, and, you know, all sorts of military grade weaponry. So we had this, you know, very scary stuff going on within the conservative movement the kind of stuff that, you know, I gave maybe a paragraph in my book, and now we get, we need to think about whether this stuff has kind of a through line to today, that whether sort of, you know, the white supremacy that uh, drove, you know, 18,000 people to fill Madison Square Garden in, uh, I think, you know, 1939 in a Nazi rally, you know, around the same time Donald Trump's dad was getting arrested in a Nazi march, you know, what's that through line to today? How does that relate to how we should think about the history of conservatism in the same way that we think about, you know, William F. Buckley as a continual influence and presence on uh, a Paul Ryan? Yeah. Well, I, I wonder if I could explore one thing that you, a couple of things that you said here. I think there's this distinction between what voters do and who they might vote for mm -hmm. and what the titular heads of a movement or a party stand for. So Certainly. it might be that, say, for instance, that someone like Buckley or, or what one would call moderate Republicans uh, or more respectable members of, of that part of American politics say they want to do right. and, and the kinds of things that are acceptable. Meanwhile, voters are willing to vote for that kind of thing. But you right. know what? They also find Donald Trump pretty appealing. And so I, I, right. I wonder, I think what yeah, I'm getting that's, at that's a that's a very That's a very, very interesting point. And the direction I would go with that is if you look at the kind of polling, even in 1984, when, you know, Ronald Reagan won a 49th state landslide, you have people 
saying that they didn't want to touch Social Security, that they thought there was not too much regulation, you know, all that kind of, I've, I've been, I've, the phrase I've been using is high church conservatism and low church conservatism. So the high church <laughs> conservatism has a set of policy catechisms, you know, uh, lower marginal tax rates, uh, shrinking the size of government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, has this kind of dog whistle relationship to race, which is what we've been circling around but haven't uh, said yet. And then you have this mass electorate that's like, sure, talk all you want about that stuff. But what we really care about is you're going to stick it to the, the, the swarthy hordes, you know, and you see that in the really smart political science research uh, in which, you know, there are findings like, you know, and I'm thinking of uh, stuff that's collected in Tom Schaller's book, uh, uh, Whistling Past Dixie. You know, the more black people there are in a county, the more likely there are to be, it is to be conservative, that the white voters will be more conservative. Or research that if you uh, correlate people's answers to questions like, you know, is it that anyone can make it no matter their race, you know, sort of uh, these attitudes that are meant to kind of create a baseline analysis of racial attitudes and you control for uh, conservative ideological attitudes, you find that the best predictor of who votes for uh, a Republican is not how conservative you are, but how racist you are, right? So these clever ways to separate out the fact that a lot of the people who are voting for Republicans, whose leaders or, you know, who are sort of on the, on, on the kind of level of the highest abstraction are talking about very much Paul Ryan type stuff about what Congress should do about the size and scope of government and uh, its technical operation are voting for those Republicans because they think that they're going to put the Mexican rapists coming over the border in their place. So they've always kind of been hearing what Donald Trump had been saying and kind of tolerating what the high church Republicans have been saying, even if they don't necessarily have any interest in it or if they're actively opposed to it. But with Donald Trump, what, what his sublime cleverness or what he stumbled into was an ability to kind of attract the affection of these voters while hiving off kind of the high church conservatism. Doubly yeah. complicated by the fact that he has accorded the high church conservatives as a way to kind of cement his power within the party. I think that's kind of become this sort of entente cordiale with the Paul Ryan wing that, yes, I'm going to sign the legislation that you send me to, you know, uh, eliminate the federal departments you don't like. Uh, to change federal procedures in ways that, you know, accord with high church conservatism and, you know, outsourcing his choosing of uh, Supreme Court justices to the Heritage Foundation, but then also saying, well, you know, maybe I'll name Peter Tile too. And that, but that also, I mean, that goes back to a Nixon land. You have a whole section on the 1966 midterms and mm -hmm. one of yeah, the arguments and you bring the, race yeah. i mean you you argue that race it, this is when there's a housing bill that's being that's right uh, kind of stifled in congress and it creates this backlash and you really show that uh nixon and many republicans played to these immense uh, racial hostilities that emerged uh, they did it sometimes subtly sometimes explicitly i think you had right. a story maybe it was a race in iowa, iowa. What what is it that they they come and they warn that like African Americans are coming from the, 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 Chicago one of the, or something? One of the one of the Democrats who wins on Barry Goldwater's coattails, yeah. uh, you know, anti coattails, and is part of this amazing Congress that you've written so eloquently about from 1964 to 1966 that basically invents the modern American welfare state, but then gets voted out of office in 1966. His name's John Schmidhauser. Right, he's still alive. Uh, he became a professor at uh, UC Santa Barbara, plays in the uh, the community orchestra there. I've, I've, I've met him. He's an amazing guy. But he got to be congressman, like a lot of these guys, for two years. Yeah. When I was, congressional delegation went from 5'6 Republican to 5'6 Democrat, only for that two-year window. And he knew something was up in 1966 when he went to a, you know, a, a, a farmer's meeting in Des Moines to campaign. And they're like, asked him about this rumor that black people were coming from Chicago to attack their town on motorcycles. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of, you know, fear, it's like the, 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 the new Black Panthers now or that sorts of thing. The 1966 findings that are most striking was that show what I'm saying is that, you know, like the high church kind of conservatives, or in this case, liberal Republicans even are saying one thing and the electorate is hearing another, is that um, 
people voted for Republicans because the Republican Party had nationalized this issue around opposition to open housing, who were in fact quite racially liberal because they associated the party with back the, you know, the, the, their own feelings about turning back the civil rights tide. And the most striking example of that is there are, is actually evidence that people voted for a, a senator named Edward Brooke, mm -hmm. uh, believing that he would help the rest of the Republican Party turn back uh, Martin Luther King, this not realizing that Edward Brooke, Brooke was yeah. actually black. He was in Massachusetts, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So oh. they vote for a black senator. Uh -huh. I mean, follow this. Right. Because he's a Republican, because they've learned that the Republican Party is going to stick it to Martin Luther King, even though they don't know that this guy, Ed Brooke, is black. Incredible. Incredible. So you talk about nationalization. You talk about low information voters. Right. That's a very right. low information yeah, right. voting right there. Yeah. But you also talk about nationalization in 66. And I, you know, naively, I've been thinking about the last 20 years as being a period of polarization in which uh, one political party's message, the Republican Party, has become quite nationalized mm -hmm. and uh, in the sense of people in different parts of the country believing the same things about race, on taxes, on guns, right. what have you. Do you think that, uh, I, I thought of the last 20 years as being a, a period when that's increased, but you're referring to a time 50 years ago when it was, when that nationalization was present. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think it's, it's a process. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a really good um, political science book. Uh, and I don't find too many good pol political science books, when I, but when I like them, I like them. And this <laughs> one's called uh, Issue Evolution. And it basically uses, you know, really solid regression analysis to demonstrate that the point in which the two parties, the perception of the electorate basically switched over from you know the republicans being more sympathetic to the democrats being more sympathetic on civil rights was around that time 1966. so it was a process you know this was a kind of the early warning beacon and say say you know if you want to think of it in statistical terms it was a spike you know it was kind of yeah. a slowly a slow evolution but it certainly spiked a lot in 1966. well if you look at voting patterns i mean presidential voting patterns geographically speaking massively shifted from 1960 to 1964 and then mm -hmm. from 64 till now have been slowly shifting. And in the last five presidential elections, patterns have been really stable. And so it's like mm -hmm. there was some seismic thing that happened in the 60s yeah. that reconfigured states, yeah. slow changes since then. And we've been kind of, we as a nation have been kind of um, stuck in place for about 20 years huh. with Democratic states and Republican states staying yeah. the same. I mean, look, California went for Gerald Ford in 1976. Right. And that, there is no Republican who could win uh, California. And yet, California has gone Democratic in the last, you know, whatever, I can't remember exactly how many elections, but it's been a lot. Right. And I mean, so just the question is, is, is Trump, you know, an aberrational sort of bit of, you know, kind of one year noise in the system? Or are we in the midst of some sort of shift? And it does Trumpism get institutionalized? Is there Trumpism without well, Trump? His voting patterns are very much like Romney's patterns. And so despite right. the massive difference in their tone and, and what they say, right. the geographic patterns are the yeah. same. So I would turn it around. And suggest, you know, even though, you know, they, 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 they're speaking different languages, what a lot of the voters are hearing is, is similar. You know, whether it's Romney saying, you know, uh, rather explicitly in, you know, that kind of uh, private meeting or implicitly in his garden variety dog whistling Republican rhetoric, that uh, you know, half the country are moochers, and you know, uh, we have that us productive Americans have to stand up for each other. Or whether it's Donald Trump saying, you know, Mexicans are rapists. What the uh, uh, electorate is here is, yes, it's it's the same people voting for the same uh, party uh, for a similar reason. But you have this crisis at the top of the Republican Party, in which, uh, and I wrote about this one actually, interestingly enough, in an article that centers around Romney's speech against Trump, which didn't get a lot of attention because it happened basically uh, the day before Donald Trump talked about his penis in a national uh, debate. Uh, <laughs> that speech, if you do a close reading of it, it becomes very plain that what freaks out the George Romneys and the accommodation that the Paul Ryans had to make about uh, Donald Trump involved issues of international economics, his relationship towards corporations, this kind of 70-year uh, project of yeah. uh, building an international trade regime, which is seen as very delicate and precious and does have this kind of bipartisan support among the sort of people who support trade deals, you know, yeah. going back to, you know, Bretton Woods. And Donald Trump just absolutely throws that all into a cocked hat. Not among the voters. They're cool with it. Like I say, this stuff was never popular among the voters, no. but among the elites of the Republican Party. And somehow uh, they've managed to make peace with each other on this. And that, yeah. 
that will be a very fascinating thing once historians are able to kind of peek under the hood and say, what kind of conversations did Paul Ryan and, and uh, Donald Trump have? What kind of conversations did the Heritage Foundation and Donald Trump have? Uh, why did Donald Trump consider this a priority after absolutely chucking over the side most of institutionalized conservatism? That's a very rich seam of analysis, and we're, we're not even beginning to understand that. But it it's does almost get, like people. I mean, it does get to some extent back to the issue of race, and so again, back to the '60s uh, when mm-hmm. when Nixon is trying to create this same coalition in some ways that we're talking mm-hmm. about today. Reagan has to do it '76 through '88, yeah. and it, both very very concerned about reaching you know kind of white working class voters, which are and these are the right. You know, so you know, Trump's you have people. You have Reagan's you know states' rights speech when he starts the campaign and the welfare queens kind of rhetoric. Yeah, going back to Nixon, you know, like having these Oval Office conversations about how they're going to get hard hats right. using the issue of patriotism, no matter what our economic policies are. They're quite explicit about it. And that's why you could argue Trump, he's inconsistent on so many things, but not on immigration. Uh, you know, this is his defining issue. And in some ways, it makes sense uh, when you take a more sweeping look. Well, a perfect example of that is... Um, Another thing I talk about Trump and why he freaks out, again, the elites of the Republican Party is, and this is another thing that I think is a, completely opens up a very rich, you know, Julian, you have graduate students, sick them on this. You know, I think that at the top levels of the Republican Party, and, and even among kind of Lyndon Johnson, you hear these kind of understandings that beneath the surface of the civil, the kind of civ, civil kind of skein that covers American politics, there are, there are dangerous energies right? It's like when Lyndon Johnson is terrified if he lets uh, Vietnam go communist, the same thing that will happen to him that happened to Democrats in 1950 when Joe McCarthy came along. That basically there's these demagogues just ready to stalk. And in the Republican Party, there was this sense that we use these energies, we exploit these energies, but we also kind of contain them within bounds. So this is the example of, you know, George Bush, you know, going to a mosque right after September 11, or Ronald Reagan, opposing a 1978 ballot initiative that would have banned homosexual teachers at a time that you know people were basically cutting down homosexuals in the streets gays in the streets so there's this idea that you, you know the idea of the dog whistle basically that that you don't really you use fire as a tool but you don't play with fire and you don't let it run wild donald trump you know doesn't care about this at all and, you know, there's just example after example, uh, when, when you see these kind of high church conservatives attacking Donald Trump, it is over, like, you know, issues that involve uh, race and immigration. And, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest, you know, the, you, you can see kind of the seeds of the crisis in the Republican Party that created Trumpism in the immigration debate during George Bush's term, in which he wants a comprehensive immigration bill. Uh, he is moving it heavily as a priority because he understands and Karl Rove understands that the Republican Party cannot survive unless, to, to use kind of academic terminology, that the Hispanics are made white. Basically, you, you cannot have this kind of pariah class in America becoming citizens and hating the Republican Party. And they have to withdraw the bill because the reaction driven by talk radio is just so overwhelming. Their phone banks are just jammed and jammed and jammed with their constituents saying, no amnesty, no amnesty, no amnesty. Right there is the seed of this contradiction between the high church and the low church conservatism. And that opens the, the way for Trump, as opposed to, you know, George W. Bush, who's this guy who, you know, we thought was about as reactionary as you can get, but turns out, you know, had these sort <laughs> of better. census energies going on. So does that mean that, I mean, I, I've been thinking about this last presidential cycle for the Republicans as a time when a weak Republican Party couldn't overcome internal divisions and was right. broken enough that an outsider can come and take it over. But the way you're describing it, you're portraying it more as uh, there's, there's this force of voters who think something different from the party. And it's not so much that yeah. uh, that the head is weak. It's just that the body has become powerful and is kind of taking over the show. Yeah. And, 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 you know, then, then you get like, you know, the role of individuals in history. You had this guy who didn't understand or care about the rules, you know, it's like these kind of gentlemanly understandings that this is how you exploit the anger of the masses of, of reactionary American voters. And this is how you don't do it. You know, you use their rage at immigrants or welfare 
in order to, and this is a very kind of uh, schematic way of putting it, preserving our 70-year bipartisan liberal trade regime, you know, right? And Donald Trump says, I'm going to screw the trade regime. I'm just going to go whole hog with this immigration stuff. And if you guys want to come along aboard, that's fine. But he doesn't come up through, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it was very fascinating in this presidential election. When I read that Evan Osnos article, The Take It First Circle, I was so bored writing about conservatives and conservative women because it was just, everything seemed so predictable. And I, I felt I knew it all. And when I read that, it was almost caused an existential crisis for me that actually turned out to be quite productive because it reminds us that history is cunning and then throws us curveballs that, wow, I didn't, this is something I didn't understand. This is something that I couldn't explain using the old rules. But what was so fascinating about the primary season was you had two candidates, both very favored in the early innings, Cruz and Walker, who are kind of like created in the conservative movement Petri dish uh, from youth. You know, you have, you know, Cruz coming from this evangelical debate culture and memorizing the Constitution. You have Walker coming up with through, through the kind of conservative institutions of uh, the Wisconsin uh, conservative infrastructure. And they're both completely, well, Cruz is completely rejected, but ultimately rejected by the electorate. And it shows that this kind of infrastructure, this conservative machine that I've been documenting being built since the time of Goldwater turns out to be something of a paper tiger. I mean, two years ago, we, we thought it was almighty. It was all knowing. It was all seeing. It was, it was omnicompetent. Well, unfortunately, Rick, we are out of time. And we didn't uh, even mention the tea party. You know, that was kind of step in the way station. In the, <laughs> the, 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 um, but the but I do, I do want to thank you. I, I want to, your, your most recent book is The Invisible Bridge, The Fall of Nixon and the Rise of Reagan. I, I really urge all of our listeners to read your books. You are uh, really the, the best historian and you've bridged uh, the world of academia and general readers very well. And you have a lot of important things to say uh, that I think are relevant to our current state of affairs. So thanks a lot for joining us. Too kind, my dear friend. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. I second all that. Before the storm was just incredible. Thank thanks. you for coming on. Well, that, wrap, that wraps up our episode. So thanks for joining us. And we'll be back soon on Politics and Polls. You've been listening to Politics and Polls, a podcast series about the 2016 presidential election produced by WooCast. The content discussed in this podcast is intended to be informational only. It does not represent nor reflect the views of Princeton University or the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs.